Long story short, I woke up one morning and I started projectile vomiting and I ended up driving myself to the emergency room. I had an MRI and when it showed I had an AVM and I ended up having brain surgery about four to five days later. And that was a long road to recovery. Finally, they approved me for a colonoscopy. And that was when it revealed I had ulcerative colitis. I told my wife and she's like, you can't, there's no way we can only eat meat. That's just not going to happen. Like you're going to get so bored of it. And I was like, look, you don't have the issues that I have where like my day revolves around having to go to the restroom and I'm just going to try it. I'd rather feel the way I do for another 40, 50 years, hopefully maybe more and not have any more issues. Okay. Good morning, everybody. We have with us Mike today. So Mike's going to share a success story. Mike, good morning. How are you doing, man? Good. How are you? I'm, I'm doing well. Where are you, where are you located? I live just outside Sacramento in a town called El Rota Hills. It's about 45 minutes from South Lake Tahoe. Okay. I've been to, I've been to Davis a few times in Sacramento I think oh, yeah. once and it's a nice area, but yeah. how are you from there? Is that where you grew up? And stuff? Uh, I'm from, it's actually just east of Davis. The town's called Vacaville is where I grew up. Oh, Vacaville. Yeah. I've seen that. Yeah. I've seen that. I think I can't remember what's over there, but I know there's like a, what is it? There's a factory out there. It's like a Skittles or something. No, it's Jelly Belly or something like oh, that. Oh yeah. That's, that's a, in Fairfield. I Fairfield. Think. Okay. It's near somebody near there, nearby there. Yeah. I, I toured that we, one time. We, yeah. We did that for field trips when I was a kid. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So interesting. So I don't eat it. Don't eat the Jelly Bellies anymore. No, but, <laughs> absolutely not. Tell us, let's just start with your background. What kind of stuff do you do? Where'd yeah. you grow up? All that type of stuff. Yeah. So I grew up in Vacaville. I'm going to be 40 at the end of this month. So it's my age frame right now. And yeah, so I grew up in Vacaville. I was an athlete from the age of six years old. I played baseball, football growing up. And then as I got into high school, we had a rugby team. So I was a three sport athlete all the way through high school. And then I went to college in Arkansas and I played football for a division two school out there. And after I graduated from there, I had a business degree. I started working in like outside sales and I absolutely hated it and I was terrible at it. So went back to school and for the past 14 years, I've been a firefighter paramedic and I've been with two different departments, but I work in Sacramento now uh, for the past 11 years. Interesting. Playing rugby, are you, are you, maybe you're watching the World Cup right now as it's going on. Do you have any predictions on that if you're watching? I, honestly, I am so far out. I don't even watch football that much anymore. <laughs> Because I don't really watch too much TV at all. And yeah, I haven't paid attention, nor do I have like cable. So I really have no clue what's going on. Fair enough. Fair world. enough. I think for the people that, that maybe know, I think it's probably France, New Zealand, South Africa, and, and Ireland are the favorites to win the thing. And they're all on the path collision course for that. So uh, anyway, I use, I, I don't watch much either. But some, some, I just got drawn in to watch it, to pay attention to this uh, one. I don't really watch the games, but I just watch, look at the scoreboard. Uh, so athlete business got sick of that fire department. So was there some, did you have some sort of health issue that, that came up here? What, how do we yeah. get to, get, get to so the Yeah, so I had some major issues over the past. This stems back from when I was a child. I can remember being very young, even six, seven years old. I always had digestive and stomach issues. We ate standard American diet. My par parents had no clue. We were a big Italian family, so our dinners and meals always revolved around pastas and lasagnas. And that's just how I grew up. Pizza, we had designated days for the week like fridays were pizzas tuesdays was like a mexican food night and so we never emphasized like healthy eating and if we did it was like my mom would make breaded chicken and then it would be broccoli and i hated all that so and yeah we ate red meat but it was always harped upon no you don't want to do that you'll get heart disease and yeah i always had issues growing up and it it gradually got worse but i had no idea because it was i just felt that was my feeling bad and crappy was like normal for me on a daily basis. I just didn't realize it until my later years because I just felt so terrible all the time. And yeah, when I was younger, I was having issues going to the bathroom all the time. And it was stressful because I wouldn't like to do it outside of the house or, and it always it created anxiety. And over the years I started having, I never had psoriasis, but I definitely remember having major like allergy skin issues where I was always itchy. I, I remember one time I like, I don't remember what I ate, but I broke out in hives like all over my entire body. And 
I remember my mom just covered me in like liquid Benadryl. <laughs> it, was, it was terrible. And so that went on for years. And then after I went off to college, I still was eating the same. I was in college. So I was just your standard college student eating, trying to get by, living in the dorms, drinking alcohol. So all those things were just lining me up to not be successful. And I was a college athlete. I was always, I'm not a big guy. I'm five, nine. When I was in college, I weighed about 205, 210 pounds. I played uh, linebacker and safety. So I always had to keep on some more weight because I had to compensate it for not being tall. So I was always, I remember my roommate and I, we would wake up at two or three o'clock in the morning. We would crush like a thousand calorie protein shake just so we were trying to keep our weight on and trying to gain mass that way. But I still had issues. And then when I was 21, so I had just finished my last year of football and this was back in 2000. I finished football in 2005 and then 2006 was the year I was supposed to graduate college. And I started having over that about eight month period, I started having migraines every day to the point where like I had to always take like Tylenol or ibuprofen. I didn't understand what was going on. I thought maybe it was just stress related from trying to graduate college. I had some back and neck injuries from football as well. So I thought maybe that I had some pinched nerves that were creating issues. But long story short, I woke up one morning and I started projectile vomiting and I ended up driving myself to the emergency room and I had an, an x-ray and then they came in and told me that they needed to drive me to another hospital in Little Rock, Arkansas to have some further evaluation. So I went down they drove me in an ambulance. I had an MRI and when it showed, I had an AVM and I ended up having brain surgery about four to five days later. And that was a long road to recovery, not like extravagant, but it took me about a whole year to get back to where I felt normal again for the most part. But I definitely had some neurological deficits immediately after I had seizures from brain swelling after the surgery. And obviously in this whole time, I, nothing I didn't know anything about diet. And this was before YouTube or any way to gain education or knowledge from that other than book reading. But I just relied 100% on what doctors were telling me. So yeah, I had the brain surgery and I recovered from that. And then I went back to, to school. I graduated college that year in the fall. And then a few years later, I went back to school to become a paramedic and got hired as a firefighter. But in this time, I also had a major issues with my GI and I was having very bad issues on a daily basis, like 10 to 15 times a morning between the time I woke up till 10 a.m. I was in the bathroom. My whole morning revolved around going to the bathroom, had to make sure I knew where bathroom stops were on the way to work or where I was going. And this, obviously, I was a little bit older now. So this was leaking into my late 20s, early 30s when this was all going on. And then when I got hired where I work now, I was having so many issues to where I had to know where every restroom was when I was on the ambulance. And it was extremely embarrassing to have to make stops along the way or let my partner, my crew know. So I finally was able to get into my doctor and we started going through some testing. And I thought I had maybe like a gluten issue, but I hadn't changed my diet. I was still eating the same. I weighed about 205 pounds then. I didn't feel like I was overweight. I still was working out like in excess. Like I thought like I need to work out two hours a day because otherwise I'm going to be overweight. And I was, nothing was really working for me. And then we kept doing tests. Doctor said, yeah, everything looks good. I don't really know what else to tell you. This is just your normal, you know, way of having bowel movements and trying to explain to them or her at the time, like what was going on and this isn't normal. So over the course of about a year, we just kept doing other tests, stool tests, everything came back negative. And then finally, they approved me for a colonoscopy. And that was when it revealed I had ulcerative colitis. And this was back in 2014. So they prescribed me Lialda at the time. I never took it. I said, I'm going to do this on my own. So the first few months was definitely nothing changed. And I switched over to gluten-free for a few months and symptoms got a little bit better, but I was still having issues with my skin. I started getting these like weird, I, I think it was psoriasis. I was, and it was only on my arms. I was getting like these, like basically like psoriasis lesions on my forearms. 
and they would flare up after meals and then they would stick around for like weeks. And I was just putting like hydrocortisone cream on them. And then obviously after using that enough, they would finally kill off the skin and it would die off. But, and then I, I was like, let's try something else. I quit drinking alcohol. And then we went and we did my wife and I, after our daughter was born, we did the whole 30. And that was like a diet thing that you just do an elimination diet for 30 days. So no alcohol, no sugar, no processed foods, only meat and vegetables. And so we did that. And it was great because we eliminated everything. I lost 35 to 40 pounds in that month, which was almost too much. I was like that skinny fat where I lost a lot of muscle mass working as a firefighter at the time. And so I just don't feel like I was as strong as I should have been or needed to be. I was extremely tired, but I was glad that I lost all that weight. My symptoms got better, but I was eating a lot of vegetables still at that time. And I was still having tons of issues in the bathroom. And when you eliminate all the processed foods, obviously you're going to feel better in a short time frame. but I still just wasn't feeling optimal like I do now. So that went on where I did the paleo and then I moved on to a ketogenic diet in, I believe, 2016. And that is where I really started to notice a huge change. I was still emphasizing eating vegetables and fruit a lot. So I wasn't, I was still noticing the effects, but I still had no real clue on like how bad vegetables were doing for me. And I don't, I never got diagnosed with it, but I think I had some sort of SIBO due to vegetable, uh, eating too many vegetables or even seed oils at the time. And then finally, I don't remember, I was watching, and I know it's kind of cliche, but everybody gets hooked on YouTube. I don't remember what podcast I was watching at the time, but it was somebody was talking about an all meat diet. And I was like, I'm just going to try this for a couple of weeks. I want to see what happens. I know it's crazy. I told my wife and she's like, you can't, there's no way we can only eat meat. That's just not going to happen. Like you're going to get so bored of it. And I was like, look, you don't have the issues that I have where like my day revolves around having to go to the restroom and I'm just going to try it. So I don't know. I think it was like the fourth or fifth day and I was completely different. Like no fog, no inflammation. I had, ar- I have arthritis. Whenever I eat any inflammation causing foods, I get arthritis. I feel like I'm 80 years old all over my body, elbows, wrists, fingers, ankles, anything, any bone that I had fractured in the, when I was younger is where my inflammation starts at first. And so I would notice those things. And I had, I would wake up in the morning, I was sleeping seven, eight hours a night when I'm home from work. Obviously when I'm at work, I don't have that luxury all the time. So my sleep schedule is messed up at times, but those are some of the things I noticed that changed the most drastically. And so that was back in 2017 and I haven't really straight away. I haven't, I don't think I've even eaten a vegetable since 2017 or 18. I tried to maybe introduce it just to see, and I immediately had a reaction and just said, nope, this isn't going to happen. So I've been eating this way. Like I said, the progress started back in about 2014 in 2015 and then progressed over a few years in the carnivore diet by 2017. Yeah. So just to back up a little bit. So you had this AVM or arteriovenous malformation for people aren't familiar with that term. So you have this abnormal communication between the veins and the arteries and it sounds like it ruptured and that's where you became symptomatic. And that's something that some people are born with or some thought that sometimes trauma can induce that. So maybe head injuries in football or something. Who knows yeah. how you got it? But anyway, you got it probably unrelated to the the whole dietary thing, I think. Maybe not, but probably. And then, so you go through that, recover from that, and you've got this, it takes you for literally decades to figure out what's going on with your gut until they finally d- diagnose you with ulcerative colitis. When you, when they told you you had ulcerative colitis and they said, well, this is how you deal with it. Did they suggest dietary shift? Did they say, hey, you're just going to be on these drugs the rest of your life? Because sometimes it's steroids, sometimes it's immunosuppressant drugs. There's, there's different things. So what was the plan from the medical side, from the gastroenterologist or the, the people that were treating you? Yeah. So I'm pretty sure it's standard that what I heard and what I recall, it was the same thing that everyone, you need to go on a a low carb, a low fat diet. You need to stay away from, obviously they, I will say that they did advocate for staying away from processed foods and sugary foods that cause it, but they, they didn't say to eliminate 
meat. They just said, limit your meat intake, increase your vegetable intake. They didn't talk about foods that cause inflammation like seed oils. They didn't, I had even expressed to them every time I eat vegetables, like I noticed a drastic change in my gut to where I'm bloated. I feel terrible. I have inflammation everywhere. So they basically related to you will have to be on this medication or a different one probably for the rest of your life. And you need to monitor the foods that you're eating because those can have a drastic effect. But if you take the medication, it should counteract the foods that you're eating. And I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. Why would I just take a pill instead of changing something else? Like I said, I never even took one dose of the medication, which still had some effects over the next few years until I landed where I'm at now. And like I said, it did improve over that time frame. A lot of it was eliminating processed foods. And then I noticed the biggest change with seed oils, any food or sauces. I moved over to using Primal Kitchen years ago, all of Mark Sisson's products, because I was trying to eliminate stuff that had 400 ingredients in it. And I had acid reflux so bad during all of this. And then I remember when I eliminated everything, especially when I moved into carnivore, I haven't had to take like a a Pepsid or any over-the-counter heartburn medications in probably eight years. It just went away. And I don't have any issues with that. I, like I said, I never took the medication that they prescribed me and I'm glad that I didn't, but yeah, they basically said, just take the medication, try to monitor the food that you eat and see if you have any better outcomes. But they've definitely pushed for me to be on the medications first and foremost. You get the colonoscopy, you get the diagnosis, here's a medication, cut out junk food. And you said, I'm not going to take the medicine. So did you go back to those guys? Did you have a use for them at that point? Was there, was there continued follow-up or what? Or did you just say, I'm done with I'm done with this stuff? I'm done with it. I never went back. The only other time that I went back to <laughs> Kaiser, sorry, is when I had a follow-up MRI for my brain, which I had back in 2016. And even that was a push getting them to do a repeat because they said they don't like to do prophylactic MRIs. I'm like, I had my head cut open and (laughs) they removed a malformation. So that was the only other time that I went back to Kaiser. I don't have them anymore. And, And I still have the same outcomes for the most part with my new um, doctors through through different health coverage that I have. And we've had discussions and we've had debates and and I I have all my blood work over the past 10 years and you can see the significant changes in all my statin levels. And like I said, we have we had plenty of debates in person about my cholesterol levels and I understand that your colitis is gone now, but your cholesterol is this. So maybe you need to go on a statin. And that's been a topic of of discussion with my doctors now for the past five or six years. And I'm just not, I'm not going to budge on what they're recommending. And even after I had, and I will say the doctor that I have now, he is definitely more open to the way I'm eating after he, he requested through my insurance to have a coronary artery calcification scan and a CR, or is it CR reactive protein, CRP scores. And my calcium score came back as zero and my CRP cardio came back 0.6 and the protein CRP came back at 2.9. So as soon as I had those tests ran, he emailed me the next day and said, you know what? Everything you're doing seems like it's working. I think that you should stay on track, but I still do recommend you taking a statin, but I know you're not going to do it. So I never... I appreciate that he at least accepted the fact that, oh, this guy's only eating red meat and eggs and raw dairy. So I don't think he's going to change, but he definitely acknowledged that whatever you're doing is working. So just keep on track. But he still had to recommend probably for his own his own medical degree and making sure that he has to recommend something that. Yeah. Like I said, I'm not going to tell you one way or the other, but it's, you should be able to, as a patient, you should stick up and do what makes most sense to you. And you're, you're right. the one that has to live with the outcome one way or the other. Yeah. Interesting, a, a recent paper on statins just came out showing that they 
at least in heart failure patients, have been associated with with significant leaky gut formation, which, again, there's evidence that that leads to autoimmune disease. And so right. it, it could have exacerbated your otherwise stable ulcerative right. colitis. Going from the norm for you was difficult bathroom, maybe multiple times a day, lots of probably loose stools, maybe some bloody stools, yeah. who knows. How did it feel to be normal for the first time? Was it, was this, this is weird. I've never felt this way in my life. Yeah, it was and like, I don't want to get into the details of the bathroom situation, but I remember that first week when I said that I felt like a completely different person. I remember going to the restroom like four or five days later and I was like, oh my God, like this is what it's like to go to the bathroom on this eating like this. And it's been that way now. I go to the bathroom once, maybe twice a day now. I don't have an urgency. I don't have to be like, oh my God, I need to be near a restroom because if I have to go, I don't, it's just, it was, like I said, I know it's weird to talk about going to the restroom, but it was one of the biggest factors for me that was a huge game changer and just feeling like a normal, like this is normal. This is how we're supposed to go to the bathroom. We're not supposed to go to the bathroom 10 to 15 times a day, all of it being diarrhea feeling terrible to changing just eating a certain way that goes against the grain of what everybody suggests and that all of my problems that were relieved they're gone like i have zero issues and i just i it blows me away that people still aren't willing to to at least try those types of things and it's hard for me i'm in a i work for a fire department that has 42 fire stations we have 700 employees and there's work there's one other guy that does this exact same eating diet and he and i look he's i think he's in his early 40s the guy looks like he's 25 years old he looks great he's in phenomenal shape we i don't eat with the crews at work i'm i eat with everybody but i prepare my own meals on the side i it's a little neurotic i bring my own cast iron skill because everybody's spraying ham and in vegetable oil after we use our cast iron skillet. So I bring my own because it's just easier for me. It was a little awkward six or seven years ago when I first started doing it because a lot of what our time at the firehouse, family time around meals, just like when you're with your family, those types of obstacles that I had to overcome early on. But now I don't care. Nobody says anything anymore unless I work at a different firehouse for an overtime or something like that. But it, it is, like I said, it is tough seeing people that I work with go through these same issues. I, I recently had one of the guys that I've worked with for the past five years, last October, he started having stomach issues. He ended up having full-blown ulcerative colitis. They put him on, he's still off of work, by the way. They put him on so many different, he was taking like 50 milligrams of prednisone a day mm -hmm. for months. And then they finally just removed his large uh, intestine. And he's got a Colostomy bag, and they just did two weeks ago. They did the J loop, and he's not going to be back until summer of next year. And he had the surgery finally in March. He had lost about sixty pounds. He was about one hundred and sixty-five pounds before the surgery, and he got down to about one hundred and five before he had the surgery. And so he's doing better now. But the weird thing for him is he didn't have the progression of issues like like most people do over years to where they their colitis starts when they're teenage years, early twenties. His just randomly one day he came in and said, Hey, I'm when you had colitis, what was going on? Did you ever have blood in there? I was like, no, nah, I never had it that extreme, but so that he went to the hospital and then they found out he ended up finding out this for the hard truth as well. But so it is hard seeing and, and it's just getting worse. There's so many guys and people and family and friends that I know that are having the same issues, but when I explain to them, hey, I'm not telling you to do this, but I'm telling you this is what worked for me and it's worth a try. And there's no way I can do that. I have to eat this. What happens if I get and that obviously the cholesterol and the heart attack and all this stuff comes up. And so I, I just I give up with, with trying to educate people because it's, it's like I'm speaking to a wall most of the time. Everybody just thinks I'm crazy, but I'm okay with it. You mentioned early on that when you first discussed it with your wife, she's like, there's no way you can do this. Now, obviously, you have done it, and you've been doing it now for, I guess, yeah. on the better side of six years. How does the wife respond to it? Is she eating oh, more she's, meat? 
we're on, we eat the same way we have a, and she's not as crazy as about crazy about it as I am. She still will eat some stuff. She likes like a couple of vegetables, but we don't eat any like cruciferous vegetables or we not, we, she does and she'll eat like carrots or pickles, fermented foods, but she eats. I cook for us every meal. We don't eat out much because I just don't like going out that often. If we do, we go to sushi and we get like sashimi and salmon or something, but I have to be, we have to be specific and say, Hey, only put butter and salt on the fish or we, and we don't do soy sauce or anything like that. Um, but she tried it when I, after she noticed a substantial change with me. And so she started doing it as well. And my wife looks amazing. She's going to be 40 in January or in February. And she has had her own issues as well. My wife's a psychologist and she runs her own private practice and she specializes in women's hormones and PMDD. And she has basically taken a lot of our food education and she's trying to tie that into her practice as well to educate her patients on ways to help facilitate their hormones and try to make some changes in the the kitchen as well, because she had so much success herself that she can advocate for that type of eating as well. Yeah, interesting. I'm in a similar situation. I remember my significant other looking at me and goes, how long are you going to do this for? And I got a year in, started getting my second year, then she started playing with it a little bit. Now she's 95% 95% just want steak every night. And oh, yeah. you know, that's the same thing. It's funny how she had been a vegetarian for many years and messed up her gut and was having gut issues for, for decades. She was always going to see the different doctors. And finally, she's now pretty much carnivore. He never has any issues anymore with that stuff. Right. A while ago, there was a there was a vegan guy named Rip, Rip Esselstyn, I think, son of a guy named Caldwell Esselstyn, who had a firehouse one diet or something it was some big plant-based yeah. diet that he because he's also a fireman apparently and did that ever make it way into your into your fire station are the guys doing that or promoting the plant-based I, I've stuff i've seen there's definitely people that work for our department and i know it's everywhere that there's not too many vegan i don't even know if there's any guys that are vegan i know there's there's definitely people that eat more heavily on the plant side and then they'll eat a little bit of meat. But I never really saw, and I've read, I've read that book years ago. And I was like, there's no way, there's no way that I'm not eating meat. And but I, I haven't seen it float around, but I, I would say for the most part, meals that revolve around the firehouse are a meat and two or three sides. The sides are salad and broccoli but it's also the crap that we're putting on it. We have every salad dressing you can imagine, and they're not good ones. They're craft or they're Safeway Select. They're the ones, the first ingredient says canola oil or vegetable oil, and there's high fructose corn syrup, or the barbecue sauces that we're cooking with, or the pan and all the crap. Like I said, the guys, when I do it, they think I'm crazy because I'm bringing in my own butter, I'm bringing in beef tallow, and that's how I'm, that's how I cook. And they're like, "Dude, you're cooking in beef tallow? You're cooking a steak in beef tallow?" I'm like, "Yes, it's amazing, and it's the best thing you can have." And I noticed one of the biggest things is my skin is like, is has gotten so much better. Like in my face, I don't have wrinkles. It's just so much lighter. I don't remember the last time I used sunscreen. I don't sunburn anymore. We go to Hawaii every year for three weeks and I'm not sitting in the sun trying to base myself for hours on end, but I can go to Hawaii for weeks and not get a summer. Same with my wife, same with my daughter. Our daughter, she's great. She's seven years old. She's not like carnivore by any means. She thinks we're crazy, Um, but she's been gluten-free her entire life. Obviously, there's some times where we don't have control of that when she goes to a friend's house or she's at school because everybody in outside of our home, for the most part, that's just what they provide. And I understand it. I don't like it. (laughs) And, but our daughter, like I said, she's way taller than I was when I was her age. She never gets sick when she does, or when she gets a cold, it lasts for 24 hours to 48 at the most. I remember when My wife and I had that seasonal flu that was going around a couple of years ago. 
we both got it really bad, but she was home with us for 10 days and never even had a single symptom. And I think a lot of it was just attributed to the way that we eat here and we have taught her to eat. And it shows so much when we're around other family and cousins that get sick or neighbor kids that get sick. And it's just, it solidifies like, this is what we should be doing. This is what everybody should be doing. But like I said, we go against the grain and it, it, it's almost in a more of an inconvenience for other people to see us the way that we are, unfortunately. Yeah, you mentioned a whole host of you know improvements with regard to your health, which is pretty, because you went on to this for your gut and then you noticed all these other things occurred. You said meat and eggs. So what is your diet day to day? What does it look like? What do you, what's a typical week of food look like for you? Yeah. So we've been time restrictive eating for years. I started doing this when I started doing keto back in 2017 and I don't, I haven't lost any more weight. So when I first lost that like 35 to 40 pounds and we did the whole 30, my weight just, it was like that, that weight I'm at right now is about 170 is like my like homeostasis. That's where I've just hovered. I'll fluctuate a few pounds every now and again, but we don't eat. We only eat twice a day. So I, I won't eat here for another couple hours till around. I usually eat around noon to one, but I'll usually have like ground beef, half pound of ground beef, three or four pasture egg, pasture raised eggs with some raw cheese sometimes. And it just varies. So that's usually my starter for the day is I'll make a couple eggs or I'll make ground beef or a steak and I'll chop it up and I'll make an omelet out of it. And then I don't snack at all. I'm not, I eat enough at that meal and it holds me over to dinner. And just like last night, I made a steak for both of us and three eggs. And I also had some, some shrimp. We get all of our meat. We've been getting all of our meat from butcher box for the past like six years. So I get about 600 to 700 dollars a month of meat per month from butcher box and i just i only order beef i don't have any other meat options i don't really like chicken that much and if i was it would have to be like chicken thighs just because i like the fattier the fattier meats and same with pork i don't really eat much pork it's more of hey let's throw this in for the night and I'll order that through Butcher Box. I just don't like the quality of pork and chicken at your regular grocery stores. But for the most part, I eat pasture egg, pasture raised eggs every day, probably between eight to ten eggs a day, and then usually ground beef or some sort of steak that I have. Yes, let me just Same because way. your diet is pretty much purely carnivore. And for the people, because a lot of people will say any diet would have worked as long as you got rid of the junk food, but it sounds like you had already done that. You'd already cleared all the junk food and you were eating obviously some meat, but also some vegetables and maybe some fruit. What has been the difference for you compared to where you're eating a clean diet without junk food, but with fruits and vegetables versus all meat? What, what's what been the difference for your symptoms? Was it night and day? Was it a little bit better? Was it a lot better? What, what do you think? Absolutely 100% night and day change. Like, like I said, it, I like now that I can see the progress that I went through the whole tunnel of different food ways to go to end here. Now, and like when I started doing this, YouTube and educational videos on carnivore and keto wasn't as prominent 10, 11 years ago. Um, and now it seems like it's become so popular that, you know, people are jumping straight into carnivore without kind of having this elongated way of trying different ways to see what could work. And like I said, eating vegetables and fruit for some people, they may have zero symptoms and more power to them. For me, it does not work. I tried last earlier this year, I tried to do the whole Paul Saladino adding fruit and honey in. And I found myself becoming addicted to <laughs> creating like basically desserts out of strawberries and honey or like a yogurt and honey. And I gained weight. I gained seven pounds in a month. I wasn't like overweight, but I just felt, I didn't feel good. And I just was like, this isn't where I started having flare-ups again of colitis, not substantial, but like going to the bathroom was a little bit more frequent and wasn't the same consistency that I've been having. So I tried that for a few months and said, nope, this isn't going to work. I can't do it. I just, my body just shuts down with, with the sugar and the fruit, like it tastes amazing, which was tough because it having that fruit 
taste and sensation come back again was like, oh my God, this is so good. But within a couple of days, I started feeling inflammation. I started feeling back pain, which I had occur a couple of years ago when I had COVID back in 2021. I was I had shadowing on my lungs and I was coughing so violently that I herniated a disc in my L5S1 and I had a pars defect also. So I had a small fracture going into 2022. I was off of work for months, for about six months. And so that was when I switched back. I said, it's funny that you had started going, trying to go back towards keto a little bit with yours, your eating style due to your neck injury. I did this kind of unknowingly, but I remember when I had initially switched over to keto that all of my inflammation had basically went away. So early 2022, right after I was supposed to have back surgery, they were going to do a a lift to repair the PARS defect. And I was going into urgent care almost every other day to get toward all shots because I couldn't walk. And my back pain was, I was having back spasms so bad that my wife got me a walker and to get around the house and the toward all shots would last a day or two. And then I ate to admit it, but I was off of work. I was depressed because I was injured. I had a young kid, couldn't play with her. I was obviously drinking a little bit more than I probably should on a daily basis because I had, in my opinion, it was the only thing that was helping pass the time. It created a substantial amount of inflammation. I was eating, I wasn't eating vegetables, but I just wasn't on point. So I went back to eating a ketogenic diet. I stopped drinking alcohol within two to three weeks. Almost all of my back pain had went away. I went in for my pre-op surgery and told the doctor, the the surgeon, I was going to operate on my back, what was going on. And he said, I'm not touching your back. I'm not doing surgery. I was 38 at the time of 37. And two months later, they released me to go back to work in March of 22. And I've been back ever since. I've probably been on 40 fires since then. And I've made it through each one. And I haven't been back to a doctor for it. So I believe the inflammation that I had due to poor lifestyle that took over once I was off of work leaked over and caused tons of more inflammation in my gut, which caused inflammation throughout my body and my back. But, and I noticed a substantial change in my back issues again earlier this year when I tried to introduce fruit and honey back into my diet. Yeah, fair enough. And, and I've seen now a number of people who have tried to go down that route. They get, it's almost seductive. Hey, I can have fruit and all this stuff and it's sweet and I like that stuff and I'm already a sugar addict in, in a way. And it doesn't work out. Some people it does, some people it doesn't. So it's interesting to see who does that. But let me ask you, the fire department, we traditionally associate firemen as being in shape. It's a physical job you need to. Are there still ongoing physical fitness standards you have to make once you get out of the fire academy or is it just just show up for work and they don't really care anymore. And are you seeing a lot of guys sitting around and getting fat and out of shape that are firemen? Yeah. Unfortunately, once you get hired, you get through a fire academy and then you we have a one year long probation phase where you're continuously getting tested to make sure that you're competent enough to be working online. And then once you get off of that, you're just on your own. Like you just show up for work and you work your couple of days. There's no, we do have annual physicals that we go through but it is not a it's more of like a subjective thing oh hey this is what your labs look like you should probably change this there's not any work status where hey if you need to keep your weight in this range there's a zero unfortunately there are like i said there's six or seven hundred of us just in our department and we also border four or five other large departments in the sacramento region that are all in our same union so we have thousands of members and it's not not just ours. It's everywhere I, I go. I meet firefighters all over the you know state or country on vacation, and there's just no standard of keeping in shape or eating a certain way. They definitely advocate for it. We have a health and safety coordinator, and he's actually I've been trying to grease him the past few years on doing carnivore, at least exploring it. Because when I initially did, he thought it was crazy. And I was like, why don't we try to push some stuff out? I don't want to like, seem like I'm peddling stuff. Maybe we can put out some information for people that are having issues because we're seeing tons of cases of cancer increases with guys that are in their thirties and forties, tons of issues with people being injured at work and obesity is definitely rising. 
So yeah, it's just like now for me, like seeing the fire department, yes, there are everybody for the most part works out and tries to put off an allure that they are healthy and they're working out. But then you see them in the kitchen. And if you go into our pantry at work, it's it's sad. Like we all pay a certain amount of month. It's called a food fund. And then someone is the food fund manager at the station. They go buy all the food. You open up our pantry at any firehouse, it looks like a 7-Eleven in there. There's there's cookies, there's Twizzlers, there's chocolate covered almonds and peanuts. And it sucks because I pay into it every month. I don't use a single thing. So my money's just contributing to the masses. And so that, yeah, it's tough to see that. And I hate that aspect that there's no advocacy for it. There's not saying, okay, you guys can't buy this with these, with the funds you have. It needs to be allocated towards this. It's, there's just no, and nobody is food and health and, not just the firehouse, but I think anywhere you get around it, it's turned into like a religious thing where people become so defensive that you can't even have a conversation about it. People just lose their shit. And it's unfortunate that you can't even like, like I said, it's become more of a religious style of topics for discussion around family homes or the firehouse big time. Do you guys, in your capacity as a firefighter, do you get into the EMT side of things much? Do you go to calls where you're just picking people up out of their homes and stuff like that? Or is it all just purely firefighting? I wish that it was purely firefighting. 95% of the calls are going. I'm a paramedic. Um, I've been a paramedic since 2018, which, so we're also EMT. So you have to become a, an EMT before you become a paramedic. So you basically just have a dual license. Your paramedic supersedes your EMT. But we go to... I'm on a fire engine. We have ambulances with our department, and then we have ambulances that are ran by like an ambulance company throughout our county as well. So anytime someone calls 911 for chest pain, shortness of breath, fell down, couldn't get up, trauma, car accidents, shootings, we go on the fire engine or the fire truck as a first responder. So we'll get in there. We'll do all the initial patient assessment get them started on vital signs, cardiac monitoring, medications if need be. And then once the ambulance arrives, then we basically just do pass over to the ambulance crew and then they take them to the hospital. And how often are you seeing people when you go out for these ambulance calls and, you know, that type of stuff, are you seeing people who, you know, in your opinion, I guess their problems are due to poor lifestyle. Is it most of them or some of them? I would say... 9.99%. 9.99%. You go into these people's homes and there's just, you rarely go on a 911 medical call for a healthy person. Usually if you do, it's for someone that was unfortunate and they had a traumatic injury or they're in a, in a car accident and it was just bad luck. We're not going to their homes for blood sugar issues or chest pain or shortest breath. We're going to people's homes that have been sedentary for years they're extremely overweight. We're going on people in their 30s that are three, 400 pounds with full-blown type 2 diabetes. They have CHF, they have COPD, and you go inside and there's just junk food everywhere. There's two liter bottles of soda. And you're like, dude, what are you like? You're not, and people just aren't willing to change. That's just, and it's sad to see that. And I don't, they're not maliciously doing that. They've just eaten like that their entire life and it just gradually got worse. But every medical call that we go on, like I said, is usually someone that is very unhealthy. They do not take care of themselves. And then when you ask them, oh, hey, are you, do you have high blood pressure? No. And then you look in their cabinet and they've got 15 different cardiac meds. I don't have high blood pressure anymore because I take medications. That's not how that works. Okay. <laughs> like, yes, you do. So yes, we every call that we go on, like I said, there aren't any calls that we go on for service where people are healthy unless they were in an unfortunate traumatic event. Yeah, fair enough. I, I, I'm not surprised by that, to be honest. So let me, I want to make sure I try to ask this with everybody. Any negatives to your, to shifting to a carnivore diet? Has it been negative for you in any way? Has there been any like health negatives or any kind of negatives that you would, you, 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 you had to deal with? No, nothing negative at all. The only negative thing is I that I didn't know this 25 years ago, 20 years ago. The one issue that I do have, and it's not with the food, it's 
I, like I said, I don't like to go out to eat dinner anymore, which is unfortunate because I just don't like other people preparing my food. I know how to cook a steak perfectly. I don't like the way that they're cooked in restaurants. The tough part is when we go for like holidays, like Christmas, Thanksgiving. It sounds crazy, but I usually bring our own food because it and it's, it seems rude sometimes with my family. They're aware of it now. So I won't eat. I, if they cook it a certain way or they put certain oils on it, I, they know that I can't eat it or won't eat it. So if we go somewhere, I'm toting around bags of, of meat and food to bring. So that's the only part that's inconvenient is having to do that. Like this last week, my wife and I went up to Lake Tahoe for a wedding and I was so stressed out what they were going to serve because originally I had checked, they only had like salmon and chicken on the, the wedding list. And I was like, dude, I don't know if I can eat. What are they going to have on it? And then all the sides. So we we ate before we went. And then they actually ended up having New York strips there. But they were covered in like a balsamic reduction, which I guarantee had sugar in it when they reduced it. I ate it. And I actually was fine the next day. But I started having some joint issue yesterday. My heels, I've broken both my ankles and both my heels the last two days. I felt like I had the worst plantar fasciitis again. So I sat and I have a sauna here at the house, a big barrel sauna that I do every day. So I, I felt a lot better the last two mornings after I sat in the sauna for 30 minutes. But yeah, the, the biggest inconvenience with eating this way is just having to bring tons of meat with me wherever we go traveling or we're gone for a couple of days. Is, that's the issue that I have, but it's a good issue to have for me. Yeah, I guess it's better than spending half your day in the toilet type yeah. of thing. So there's yeah. just a trade off with that. But you'd mentioned frustration trying to convince other people that are suffering identical fees. I feel sorry for the guy at your work that rapidly went on to have a colectomy. You know, he's got, yeah. it sounds like an ileostomy. And have you had any success with people that have had ulcerative colitis that you've talked to? I don't know if you have a social media account or anything like that, but have you been able to influence anybody other than your wife? That has been now, able to change. Unfortunately, so I don't have. I I literally just created a Twitter or an X account probably two or three months ago, and then I've only I I don't have Instagram. I don't have. I created the the X account because I have some real estate on the side that I was trying to sell. So I was trying to figure out some, and then I started seeing all these same guys that I watch on YouTube between yourself, Chafee. Saladino, Mark Sisson. So I started seeing like all these different guys pop up on social media. And that was when I reached out and sent that picture of me a couple of weeks ago. And you had replied to send an email. But honestly, like I have not had much luck. I tried to start advocating it five or six years ago in the firehouse. And it just turned into, like I said, a religious debate, like put against the wall, getting questioned, guys talking shit and just giving me a harassing me for eating that way. You're going to have a heart attack. You're going to die when you're like 40 years old. So honestly, like I, it sucks to say, but I just stopped talking about it because just pissing in the wind. Guys just don't want to hear it. And I don't have social media presence too much where I'm trying to advocate it. I've started posting, not really posting, replying to people's posts on Twitter, but you look on there and it just turns into people ranting. I, I'm sure you had your share of that. And, and so, it, it, yeah, it sucks. And it's tough too, because my family on both sides, like my dad passed away 12 years ago from multiple myeloma when he had just retired. He was a truck driver for years. He had multiple myeloma and died six months later. The entire time he's in the hospital, he's on insure and all this crappy foods and everything. So nothing helped him. My mom poor health as well. Same with my sister, actually, she has finally, she had a bunch of hormonal imbalances. She's overweight. And so these last few weeks, she's been asking me tons of questions. And finally, over the weekend, she's like, all right, I'm doing it. I'm switching. I'm going to give it a cup. I told her you got to at least do 90 days to see how this works. And then if you feel better or you want to start introducing things, at least give it three months to see how it goes. My mom, on the other hand, she's not going to change. My wife's mother, she has type 2 diabetes. She's she's so hard-headed. And I've been preaching this to her for years. Just She just can't get off sugar. And I'm like, and she has breast cancer. And I'm like, God, what are you doing? Like, just listen to me. Like, just give it a try. I'm not 
saying, go 100% carnivore. I understand it's tough, but you got to eliminate this stuff. And she's like, what if I get these cookies that say keto on them? I'm like, no, it doesn't work that way. Look at the back. There's 47 ingredients of junk on it. You can't even pronounce them. But it's, yeah, it's, it's it definitely, tough, it, it's an uphill battle for sure. But you do find that there are a number of people that are receptive to this and some of them have oh, to yeah. be so desperate, but I, I'm, I'm glad you came on and did this interview because this will impact people. Several, many thousands of people will watch this and some of them, they may share it with a friend that has ulcerative colitis. And because you're, the medical system doesn't really have any good answer. It's, it's really, it's half the doctors don't think diet has anything to do with it. The other, and, and then all of them want to just, here, here's all these drugs you're going to take the rest of your life. And hopefully your colon doesn't have to come out or something like that. But, right. and I just, I, I can't imagine how many people who probably unnecessarily had surgery like that when they could have probably avoided all that just by changing right. their uh, their diet around. We've got just a couple minutes left. Is there anything that you left out that you want to share in the last few minutes here? Um, I was just going to go over some of the changes in my lipid panel from the past 10 years. I wrote down the very beginning. To okay, where sure, it's sure. Go ahead. I also started... It was a couple of months ago and I had watched uh, a podcast with a few gentlemen and they were talking about the lean mass hyper responders like Dave Feldman and Ken Berry, a few other guys. And I realized like, holy crap, like I'm pretty sure I am because the drastic change. So like back in 2014, my total cholesterol was 173. The HCL was 60. The triglycerides was 54. My LDL was 104. So and that was when I was that healthy. So yeah, that, that that would be a generally considered a healthy lipid panel by just about everybody. Yeah. Some people might say your 104 should be below 100, but honestly, most physicians would be very happy with that lipid panel, I think. Yeah. So that was 2014 when I still had full-blown ulcerative colitis, 40 pounds heavier than I am right now. So you're sicker. You're clearly sicker physically, yeah. but your labs look good. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and... 2023 this uh, the last four years my labs have been almost exactly the same like the numbers have been off by a couple points so my my i, I talked about the coronary artery scan was zero mm -hmm. flat fasting glucose was 71 h h a one or h b a one c was 5.3 total cholesterol was 390 mm -hmm. my ldl for the past four years has been 265 to 270 my HDL was 91 and my triglycerides was 50, 51. So I had a 0.56 ratio from the triglycerides to HDL. Yeah, uh, you're you're exactly in this so-called lean mass hyper responder cohort because you're lean and healthy otherwise. All your other metabolic markers, I presumably look good. And that study that Dave and Dr. Budoff, and, and I, I don't know if there are any other authors on the study, will be finishing up in February. And I'll, right. they'll... they'll tabulate the data and, and release it. And so we'll find out what it shows. But the preliminary, the basic, their baseline data was quite encouraging with CCTA, computerized C, you know, CT angiography, where you get a real fine look at even a soft plaque, which people are critical about the CAC score. And basically showed that all those people that have the exact same numbers as you, and, and even much older, the average age of 55, I believe, had almost zero evidence of plaque. It was extremely low. So it's encouraging. So hopefully it turns out that study shows what we think it might show. And that'll give you at least maybe some solace with those yeah. numbers, but irrespective, would you even, even let me ask you this guy. I think this is an important question. If those numbers that you have increase your risk for heart disease, 10%, 20%, would you go, would you trade it for going, going back to what you were doing? Is it, how do you balance that? Absolutely not. There's no, it's hard to like even fathom feeling so terrible. And I will gladly risk eating this way to not feel overweight, not feel bloated, not feel inflamed. My face was like a basketball and I felt awful. And I was in the bathroom. I'm not exactly 10 to 15 times every single morning. Why would I ever even think of trading that in to eat vegetables and fruit to have that all come back to lower my risk by maybe 10 to 15%. That just doesn't, and I, you've said it before, we're all going to die of something. We're all going to die of a heart attack at some point, whether it's when you're 90 or hundred years old, I'd rather feel the way I do for another 40, 50 years 
hopefully maybe more and not have any more issues because when I see the people that I know as family that are all on medications and they're overweight and they have cancer, like I'm pretty sure it's all related to what we've been putting into our bodies our entire lives. Yeah. Not a doctor. I'm not a scientist. Color spade. I know what it does. Food is trying to kill us <laughs> that they're creating. Yeah. And I refuse to go back and eat anything that causes me to have what I once did. Oh. It's just not a benefit for me. Yeah, fair enough. And and just, I do have to go here. What is your Twitter handle for people that may want to ask you a question? If you um, it is, sorry. Like I said, I don't have a Twitter. I guess it's called X um, now, the X handle. X. It's changed Carnivore now. MG47. Carnivore MG47. Okay. Yeah. All right, Mike, thank you for doing this. Appreciate it. the rest of the folks. Thanks for being here. We'll be back again tomorrow. You guys have a great start of your week. Thanks, Mike.